Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our monthly um, Grand Rounds, and I, I'm pleased to be here with you. And um, I'm Dr. Vincent Dean. I'm the Director of the Palliative Care Services here at home for both inpatient and outpatient clinics. And um, as some of you may know, that we also have um, a Palliative Medicine Fellowship here at Hogue, and this is where we finish up our third year in partnership with UC Irvine. So this afternoon, you're gonna be in a treat where two of our fellows who are finishing up uh, their fellowship with us um, will be sharing their stories. And um, let me just go ahead and introduce them to you. The first is Dr. Matt Jansen. Please stand, Matt. Dr. Jansen um, received his degree from UCLA and did a emergency medicine residency at UC Irvine. And in his last year at UC Irvine, he was the chief resident. Prior to coming to uh, us here at Hogue, he spent about 10 years with CEP, which is the California Emergency Physician Group, which is probably the largest emergency physician group uh, in the West Coast, if not the United States. So for a while there, before he came here, he was also the assistant director of one of their uh, emergency rooms. Next to him is uh, Dr. Ron McCowan. Ron? Dr. McCowan got his, uh, received his uh, degree from Loma Linda. He went on to do a um, uh, internal medicine and a cardiology fellowship at the White Memorial. And then he ended up going to a, a small place in Ohio called the Cleveland Clinic to do his electrophysiology fellowship and uh, he spent about 25 years or so in private practice in West Virginia. He missed California, so he decided to come on home and, uh, and spent a, a, a year or so with us in uh, palliative medicine. And we're glad, um, Ron and Matt, for being here. And I'm really proud of these guys. Um, they'll be our, our fourth and our fifth fellows who have graduated from our palliative care services. And, and so our program certainly has evolved over the past year here at Hogue. So that leads us to my, the title of my presentation, and it's entitled, The Present and Future of Palliative Care. I see myself here at Hogue as the present because we're here today, but I see these two physicians, they're gonna be the future of palliative medicine for tomorrow because once they're done with their fellowship, they're gonna be out there leading charge of various institutions and organizations to, to continue to push this, not just from a primary physician like myself and a geriatrician, but also as cardiologists and emergency physicians. So with that said, um, we know that as life, you know, with life-threatening illness and serious chronic health conditions, brings to us an array of tough questions and challenges. And what do we mean by tough questions and challenges? Well, the challenges, you know, is about, you know, how do we solve issues when people are sick? Well, the good news is life expectancy has certainly um, gotten a lot better within the last 100 years. And, um, but however, the bad news is the death rate remains 100%. So that gives us, uh, that is certainly not something that we're able to solve anytime soon, but someone is out there is trying to do that. So the purpose of today's presentation, and really it's more of a discussion and sharing our story, are, are three things. This, this unders we're gonna underscore the benefits of palliative care and uh, that's often misunderstood and, and underutilized. Um, I share this with you in the past. I've been up here many times before, but I can certainly tell you the, 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 you know, the program has certainly evolved significantly and there's a lot more uh, receptive uh, to the work that we do in palliative medicine that's often misunderstood as being end of life only in hospice, which it's not. It's a lot broader than that. And we're gonna highlight some evidence that um, recommend um, to programs all across the United States how to provide e effective palliative care services. And the last is describe how palliative medicine can be successfully integrated into cardiology and the emergency um, departments. So let me start off with a slide by Dr. Cassell um, who defines the goal of medicine. Uh, he, states, he states that the relief of suffering and the cure of disease must be seen as twin obligations of a medical profession that is truly dedicated to the care of the sick. Our failure to understand the nature of suffering can result in medical intervention that, though technically adequate, not only fails to relieve suffering, but also becomes the source of suffering itself. So this is, of course, we know this, everyone dies. But, but death itself is not an inherent failure, 
but the failure is what we call neglect. So as physicians, so what do we neglect? Well, what do we, we need to understand, we need to understand what matters most to the people. Ask the patients and their family, what are their priorities when faced with a serious illness? Because we know that people have other priorities besides just living longer. And so the only way that we know about what's important to people is to ask them. So the part of work that we do in palliative medicine is to spend a lot of time sitting with the patient and understanding their values, their goals, and their preference, and understand where they are in their journey. And besides that, there's also, that's the soft part of palliative medicine, but there's also a very clinical hardcore where physicians are spending a whole year of fellowship learning the art of palliative medicine in pain management, symptom management, but understand the whole spectrum of medicine that's, that's involved in caring for people who are seriously ill. I'm gonna to highlight to you what are some of the things that we, we talk to patients and family about is we clarify what is their understanding of their illness. And every day when we see patients, and I was in the ICU today, and, and speaking to one of our patients I've been seeing in clinic, she says to me, I have all these doctors coming by the room, I don't even know who they are, they didn't give me a card, but you know, I'm just so overwhelmed, Dr. Nguyen. So I sat there, I listened to her, and just sort of navigate, help her to understand that you know, we're here to help you to fight your illness, and we're here to, as a team to, co you know, we're trying our best to coordinate within the system, and I wanna know what's important to you. I want you to know, tell me what, is, what did your other doctors told you about your current condition and how can we help you? And what are your fears during this time? Ask people what they're the most afraid of. What are they hoping for? Their goals and their priorities. And I think these, these are very important pieces as physicians. We need to make sure that we ask our patients besides just coming in and say, I, you know, x-ray looks good, wound looks clean, and you're out the door. For these people who are suffering from serious illness, they need that, just that little five to, not five minutes, maybe a minute or two of your time just to sit down and say, hey, this is what we're working on. We're gonna get you better as best that we can and, and uh, get you home, certainly. But tell me about your, your hopes and your priorities. But of course, we understand there are barriers to this as well. Well, barriers with, is within physicians and patients, but also we live in a, in a society that is basically very death-denying. We don't like to talk about end-of-life issues, and that's our society and our culture. But besides this physician-patient relationship, there's also the family involvement, which makes it very difficult sometimes for us to deal with. And so we like sometimes when we have to deal with difficult issues, well, we stick our head in the sand, Maybe it's better we have a few other people that we can stick our heads in the sand with, and maybe we have a whole society too. And so denial isn't just for the lay public, but we know that doctors too, right? And we have denials, because what are we denying? Well, we're, we're afraid because you know, we feel that patients and family are not ready to have these kind of discussion because it's just too difficult. Engagement is viewed as the beginning and the end, and I don't want to take away people's hope and what are the fears, what are the myths that are out there? Well, it takes away hope. You know, you really want to talk about this, you know, about these end of life issue because it makes people depressed. I'm in, the, I'm, in the, I'm in the business of making people better, giving them hope. I don't want to make them depressed. And you know, if I talk to them about this, it makes, you know, they may die sooner. You know, it's, they give up hope and they die. But I want to say this, is these are all myths. And studies have shown, as I'm going to present to you, that an article from JAMA and, and um, from Dr. Wright, and he talked about um, his articles on, um, on the association between end-of-life discussion, patients' mental health, medical care, death, and caregiver. He said that you know, there was no change in depression or anxiety when doctors have this discussion, end-of-life discussion with their patients. It also reduces unnecessary ICU admission. People, don't, people are getting the care that they want now, their lower rate of ventilator support, decrease of rate of CPR, people are, and uh, earlier hospice en enrollment, and studies again have shown us when people receive hospice or early palliative care, they actually live longer. Yes, they actually live longer with, with support, and it makes sense. And, uh, and they have a better quality of life, um, not just for the patient, but also for the caregiver themselves. And, um, and, and and we know that less aggressive care at the end of life to try to prolong an, 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 an inevitable situation, people actually have a better quality of life. 
But as doctors, we always have hope for these patients. The ideal of hope is, you know, we are smart enough, strong enough, surround ourselves with really, really smart people, and we work hard enough, we could, could keep your people from dying. And so, you know, I have one of these buttons that trust me, I'm a doctor, because patients trust us. Our words become so important to these people. And of course, the, our hope is, you know, sometimes in the face of no cure, I always believe that healing can take place with truth and with a, with a kind, right kind of compassion that we can help shift that hope for a cure to, a sh to shifting that to a healing that takes place at the end of life. And, and I always talk, I like to talk about healing in terms of the, now not necessarily the physical, but also the emotional, the psychological, and the spiritual healing that takes place. So here's another slide that just drive that point home. You know, you can see the long line for a reassuring lie and a much shorter of anybody for the inconvenient truth. If, if you've seen the, um, Dr. Atul Gawande, um, some of you may have heard his book on being mortal, and there is also a PBS special. And the book talks about how, how physicians, how ill-equipped and how unprepared we are to have these kind of conversations for people at the end of life. In his book, Being Mortal, Dr. Gawande spoke about how difficult it was for him to care for some of his patients when he knew that they were dying, and he even admit, yeah, I lied to the family and the patient that, yeah, she's gonna be fine, because he didn't know what other way to tell the patient. And he also shares the story of when his father was dying, and he has this, uh, a, um, a spinal cord tumor, and the surgeon looked at him and said, oh, dad will be fine, next week he'll be playing tennis, won't be a problem. And it did, it did both he and his dad and his mom, they're all doctors, they looked at each other and said, that's not, that's not right, and they laughed about it. But so basically, a reassuring lie is, some, is, is much more easy to sell than an, an inconvenient truth. In September of 2014, the Institute of Medicine came out with um, um, a recommendation through this Dying in America. It's a, it's a, a nice size booklet. And it talks about how, you know, how we can improve quality of care for people facing end of life issues and how important it is for, for doctors and for the healthcare institutes to basically get on the bandwagon to, to really improve care for people. And so they have five recommendations. The first recommendation is about patient person-centered care, which include the patient and their family. The second piece is the importance of advanced care planning and goals of care. Where doctors, we need to talk to our patients about what's important to them, about advanced directives, about what's, you know, what the treatments entail and, 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 what's, and what are their values and what are their preferences. The fourth, I'm actually the third is about how do we engage residents and, and physicians of tomorrow, the importance of palliative medicine. The fifth, uh, I'm getting confused, I'm getting one, two, three, okay, four. Fourth recommendation is, you know, we need a much better way of, of, of um, reimbursing physicians to do this kind of work, you know, such as paying doctors to have a conversation with patients about what's important to them. So as of this year, or it was January 2016, doctors are, you know, we are able to, to bill to have these kind of conversations about goals of care discussions. And the fifth piece is, you know, we need to engage the community to start talking to patients about, about palliative care is to break the myths. And I can, I can proudly share with you is this is exactly what we're doing here with our palliative care program here at Hogue to really, except for the but the financial piece, that's really being, it's a much bigger piece than, than, than what we're doing here, but about engagement with the, with the community, training physicians, training nurses, training um, social workers, as well as having advanced care planning and goals of care with a patient. This is what we're doing. So, but understanding what are the needs of palliative care currently, and you know, for oncology patients, one, there's one oncologist for 145 patients with new cancer diagnosis. For cardiology, for every one, I'm, I'm sorry, there's one cardiologist for every uh, patient who have a heart attack. When you look at palliative medicine, for every 1,300 people with serious illness, there's one palliative care doc. So we know that there, the tide is, is booming, and there's not enough of us to do this work. And you look at the, the number of states that does not even have access to a postgraduate training in palliative care. And so here at Hogue, we're just contributing to what we can to a system that is so much bigger than ourselves. 
So what we want to do here is, you see, some of you may have seen this slide before, but I just want to reiterate and reemphasize a few things. You know, this is a delay model. Oftentimes we treat patients and we say, well, we have nothing else to offer you, throw you on hospice. But what we want to know, know, focus on, however, is when patients are, are, are presenting to us with a serious condition and as the disease progresses toward death, as doctors, we should be focused on really two things. First of which is very important why we go into medicine is to see if we can slow down the disease process in the hope of a cure with our disease-modifying therapy. But that should be also be provided alongside with symptom control, which is supportive care. And as the disease progresses, the, pro progresses, the, the proportion of our focus on care should be more towards symptom control and supportive care as a, as a person. Um, disease pro uh, progresses, and that portion of symptom control and supportive care is called palliative care. And there is this other thing called hospice. Well, hospice is toward way down the end of the line where you know, the serious illness becomes a terminal illness with a prognosis of less than six months. And so how does hospice and palliative care work? It's really a continuum. With palliative care being able to be rendered when patients are first sick, when they have a serious illness that's delivered while they're getting cured of treatments as the disease progresses, that palliative care may transition to more end of life, um, focusing on delivering symptom control more than the disease um, to focus treatment itself. So the present future of palliative care. So you know, we understand where we are today. But we, you know, where we are is, I, I share this with the team, is we live in an incredible time. I mean, healthcare changing is changing, and we are able to shape this, and we're watching the transformation right in front of our eyes. And so there are many unmet needs, and there are not enough resources to meet the demand. But with that said, um, that doesn't stop us from trying, and this is not something that we do alone. And I always love the African proverb, is, you know, where it says, you know, you want to go fast, go alone, but you want to go far, take a lot of people with you, you go with a group. So with that said, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Next speaker is Dr. Ron McCown, our cardiologist and electrophysiologist extraordinaire and palliative medicine expert in a month. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. I want to take a little moment to thank Dr. Nguyen for the opportunity to speak with you today, but also to thank him for putting me on this new road of understanding uh, palliative care. Also would like to thank uh, Dr. Ito, who is here today, for her instructions and, and her guidance. And uh, the rest of the team, I, I, I think I saw um, Ellen, yes, Letty, uh, Pastor Gerald, and if I miss someone, I, I apologize. I'm sort of under a um, time restraint here, so I want to get um, going and make sure I give you the information I need to give you today, very quickly. Um, Dr. Nguyen has mentioned how I got here, uh, with the exception of talking about how I actually made the decision to go into palliative care rather than to do something else. Um, I had the opportunity of spending some time on the ethics committee with uh, a couple of physicians that were in palliative care. And I just loved the way they thought, and I loved the way, the way they talked to patients. And I thought that's a wonderful thing. And so let me see if I might be able to fit into that. And it's been a wonderful uh, educational process. I also want to thank the staff here at um, Hogue for how great you've been uh, with us as uh, fellows. Uh, this has been a wonderful place to uh, spend time, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So um, heart failure in the United States, basically what I want to tell you about um, uh, this slide is that heart failure is a big problem that is going to increase over time. In fact, it's projected that by 2030, there will be a 46% increase in the number of patients with heart failure. So that if, one, if there's one in nine deaths related uh, to heart failure, that ratio may, may change, hopefully not. Hopefully we get uh, a fewer number of, of deaths. But half of the people will develop heart that develop heart failure will die within five years. And there's also a cost, and that cost of managing heart failure is projected to go up as well. I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, symptom management. Dr. Nguyen mentioned that as being a significant portion of what we do in palliative care. Patients that have heart failure uh, due to, and I won't go through this entire mechanism, but basically, I'm, I'm pushing the wrong button. Oh, there we go. Activation of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system uh, uh, through this cascade here leads down to increased anxiety, fatigue, dyspnea, and um, anorexia and cachexia uh, in the latter stages of heart failure. And I remember when I was treating patients, 
with uh, heart failure. Dyspnea, uh, we usually thought patients needed maybe more diuretics, more ACE inhibitors. Um, even with compensation of heart failure, those patients will have uh, dyspnea, depending upon what sort of, uh, what their New York Heart Association classification might be. Patients having uh, class four CHF obviously will have symptoms at rest versus those that are in the um, lower symptom uh, categories. Uh, anxiety and depression, fatigue. And the point I want to make here is that with these symptoms, palliative care can offer some assistance to the cardiologist or the internist who may be managing uh, the patient to sort of uh, uh, provide some assistance with managing those symptoms. Um, here's an interesting slide that I'm sure all of you are aware of, the leading cause of death in the United States related to um, heart disease, uh, followed uh, closely by, you see this 5,900, uh, 591,000 here and the 614,000 here. This is uh, malignancy. Look at how big that those numbers are. And when you look at the next slide and you look at patients that died and ended up, or as uh, before they passed away, ended up being on hospices, really disproportionate. You see this huge number of cancer patients relative to those uh, dying with end-stage heart disease, only about 10%. The question, why is there this huge discrepancy? Well, one uh, reason is because of the mode of death. Here we have uh, sudden death, uh, someone within an hour of developing symptoms, and un they, die, and un they die unexpectedly. In a terminal illness, such as cancer, you see you have this more gradual decline here. Well, from this point to that point is a period of time during which we can prepare the patient, prepare the family um, for the ultimate um, demise or passing away. I keep pushing the wrong button here. Um, this more gradual um, trajectory here is what we often see in dementia. And so here again, the big point is that there is time for preparation. Well, an organ failure such as um, uh, kidney failure, liver failure, COPD, and for pr the purposes of today's discussion, heart failure, you have these periods of decompensation with recovery, decompensation recovery. And so the question is, you know, what do we do here? What do we do here? What do we do here? And so patients may not get sent for, or they may not be referred to hospice for its benefits because we're not sure where they are in this uh, trajectory here. A little bit more about that. Let's look at this natural history of heart failure, and this is basically the crux of my presentation today. I'd like to walk you through this if I might. So we have a patient here. We have the quality of life portion of our curve here. This is basically a presentation of that curve that I showed you in the previous slide for heart failure. On the bottom side, we have our care line, and then below that, we have our palliative care line. So the patient develops heart failure. They come to the hospital, and they're treated. They get better. So why do we need palliative care here? Well, palliative care can help with um, uh, establishing um, goals of care. What does this patient want to do uh, long term? We can establish a relationship. Um, uh, advanced care planning can start here. Advanced care planning may change along the way. Or the conversation changes along the way. Um, the patient may come back with, here we have a sudden death episode and the patient may get a defibrillator. Um, and then there's a decompensation episode here. As the patient may decompensate, there's an increase in the traditional care here. But notice, there's an increase in palliative care as well, okay? And so as we're going along, and this is uh, similar to the slide that you showed earlier, where there is an increase, uh, there may be an increase in care uh, or a decrease in care, um, and there is an increase in your palliative care, and that would be more along this side of the curve here. But let's go back to here. So we have uh, an, uh, maybe another conversation that may take place. Uh, we have in this portion here the slide where symptoms may be treated in correlation, in correlation to a decrease 
in uh, the patient's compensation or another heart failure episode. Another big portion of the slide here is this um, gray shaded area right here, which represents a significant trans a transition uh, to advanced heart failure. And I can't quite read it from here, but oral therapy may not be helpful. We may be thinking about uh, other devices such as um, LVADs, RVADs, uh, that uh, might be a part of uh, the patient's future management. Transplantation might be considered at uh, this point. And notice palliative care really takes a really uptick, a great uptick right here. Um, symptom management, goals of care discussions, which can be actually quite um, prolonged over several days, not over several days, but it may take different discussions at different times to get to a point where there's an understanding of what the patient's goals are, um, helping to get everyone on page, on the same page, family members, um, other healthcare providers, and so all of that is very, very uh, important. So uh, what may happen next is we've decided to no longer seek uh, a therapeutic approach and decide to just manage symptoms and see palliative care has gone up even further. And so some, at some point here, we may even consider hospice. So we ought to be thinking about palliative care assistance earlier because um, I really think that we can contribute to the quality of the patient's life by symptom management and through uh, discussions with family providers and uh, an intense discussion with uh, the patient all along this pathway here. And the next slide, uh, this is a very busy slide that um, is from the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. The basic point here is that it's been recommended that palliative care get involved whenever there is a discussion regarding a transplant or if a um, MCS device is being considered, such as LVAD, an RVAD. And so that's actually a um, condition of participation now with uh, Medicare. And I think this next slide is my last slide. So one of the things we ought to consider is the value of hospice and, and palliative care services. Um, patients' preferences need to be discussed and they need to be documented and they need to be followed throughout the patient's um, course. Uh, the same for quality and perceived quality. What does, you know, um, what does the patient really want uh, in terms of their life? You know, a couple, several questions were posed by um, uh, Dr. Wynn, one of his slides that would deal uh, with that. One of the benefits of a hospice situation is the reduction of hospital readmissions and deaths and, and financial savings uh, is another uh, issue. So as I look forward and think about th uh, the question of how can I contribute to palliative care, what are the things that uh, need to be addressed in terms of being able to get patients into a higher quality of, of medical care. What can I do um, to help patients in cardi with cardiac problems uh, get to hospice sooner? Um, what, are the, what are those some of the reasons for under, under utilization? Sorry, Matt. I think I'm, okay. One of the reasons why, or one of the things that has to be addressed uh, as I, I look at how I can get more patients uh, to be seen by palliative care is the fact that once a patient gets better, if you recall a slide that had the, the, the dips and improvement, dips and improvement, well, when patients get better, as physicians, oftentimes we sort of close the book on that until the next episode comes along. In other words, the patients have gotten better, so we've done what we need to do, and we stop right there instead of thinking, well, you know, do I need to consider something else? Um, do I need to think about what is the patient's trajectory? Do I need to think about um, asking some of the questions that were posed earlier by Dr. DeWin? Um, the other thing that is an impediment to utilization of the palliative services is the fact that Patients 
are living longer uh, uh, these days. And also, physicians tend to be terrible at estimating survival. We want our patients to do well, and we're thinking that um, they're going to do better than they really are going to do. And so we tend not to be as objective uh, as we should be. So and I think that that is all I have to present. All right, hello and thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Jansen, as Dr. Nguyen said. I went to med school at UCLA and I trained in emergency medicine almost 15 years ago at UCI. And for those last 10 years, I've been uh, practicing as a uh, emergency medicine physician in East LA County and uh, enjoying it very much. I'd like to echo uh, Dr. McCallum's sentiments. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And particularly, I want to thank Dr. Nguyen for the opportunity to speak here and for his leadership throughout the entirety of uh, the fellowship. And also, I'd like to thank uh, the entire team here, Dr. Ito and all of the palliative care team here at Hogue. A lot of people have asked me how an ER doctor ends up going into palliative care. Uh, I'll speak to that. And a lot of people ask me what the similarities are. And one of the similarities is that emergency medicine is a team sport. There's no ER doctor who does anything on his own. And so too with palliative care. Palliative care is a team sport. And I've really appreciated the chance to work with the team here at, here at Hogue. Uh, my talk is going to be smaller in scale than Dr. McCallan's. I'm going to talk about <laughs> my, my personal experience being a physician who changed careers pretty dramatically in mid-course. And also, I'm going to talk about what I perceive as the need for palliative care, some of the opportunities I see for palliative care in the current uh, healthcare environment, and also attend to the, uh, the opportunities, some of the challenges that I see palliative care facing. So I think this graphic is a good one to start my talk with because my entrance into palliative care marked a sharp right turn in my, in my medical career in my life. Um, and how it came about <clears throat> was a combination of kind of professional experiences and expectations, also very personal experiences. My first experience with palliative care as a uh, field, as a specialty, didn't come in medical school. It didn't come early in my experience as a physician in the emergency medicine department. It came uh, through a friend. I was speaking to a good friend from college and in passing, she mentioned that her dad had some abdominal pain. Uh, PPIs had worked for a while, but weren't working anymore, and he was starting to lose weight. And when she said he was losing weight, I thought, uh-oh. And I recommended that he went to his gastroenterologist. And one thing led to another, and ultimately he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And because I was kind of the, a family friend and also the, the, uh, the honorary uh, physician in the family, I spent a lot of time talking to his doctors. And one of his doctors was a palliative care specialist. And it was the first time I realized that palliative care was a specialty, not just something that people did, but an actual specialty that could be pursued and, and uh, seriously at that. And so that was an interesting experience for me. It kind of planted the seed. He, my friend's father, and in fact, their whole family had a very good experience with hospice care. And that planted a seed. And also, uh, I was talking with some of my colleagues in emergency medicine, and I learned that one of the bigger names in emergency medicine, a woman named Dr. Susan Stone, who was the uh, residency director at USC, a big name in emergency medicine, she had actually left emergency medicine, and she had become a palliative care specialist. And that was the first time I realized that that was possible. It was possible for an ER doctor to make this sharp right turn and, and pursue something else, like palliative care. At the same time, <clears throat> I found that my professional experience was changing a little bit. I had been an ER doctor for, honestly, 15 years at that point. I chose emergency medicine when I was 26. And at the age of 40, it, some of my priorities had changed. I had more children than I had at 26. And so I found that emergency medicine wasn't offering to me what it once had. The excitement of diagnosing an appendicitis or a kidney stone was a little bit less. And I was looking for something new and different in my career. And I was looking for a field <clears throat> that I thought would offer um, some opportunity for a little more autonomy and possibly an opportunity to pursue academics. So that was the appeal for me. But ultimately, the appeal was I felt that palliative care was filling a need and that there was uh, something positive and a need to be filled with palliative care. Um, and then when I made the decision to go into palliative care, I had the choice of either trying to grandfather in and challenging the boards that way or uh, going through a mid-career fellowship. And it took probably three years to commit to taking a year off of my life and my schedule uh, to pursue a fellowship, but I think it was the right choice for a number of reasons. I think for somebody like me, 
it was the only appropriate way to pursue a new career. And frankly, now that the fellowship's over, I'm delighted I made the decision. Uh, so I said, I think palliative care serves a need, and I think that within medicine there's been a need to be filled. <clears throat> I think many of us can remember back to our, some of our first experiences in medical training. And one of my first experiences was before medical school, I drove an ambulance, and I drove an ambulance for Schaefer here in Costa Mesa. And I remember distinctly the first time I ever did CPR in my life, we were called out to a petite Asian woman, well in her 90s, who had, had a GI bleed, collapsed at her skilled nursing facility, <clears throat> and we showed up, and I did CPR on this woman, I broke every rib in her chest, and we brought her to Hogue, and we had resuscitated her against all odds, and I remember distinctly, as we brought her to the ER and dropped her off, the ER doctor looked at me just astounded, and he didn't say it, but I could read in his face, what, what on earth are you doing? You, you haven't helped this woman. Uh, now she's desperately sick and in terrible pain. And I remember driving home, not with this tremendous sense of accomplishment that we had done CPR and saved a woman's life, but just kind of a niggling sensation that I'd done something wrong. And that has stuck with me throughout my career in medicine. Uh, I work in the ER. Heaven knows in the ER I have seen many patients who come in frail, cachectic, clearly in their last days dying of a terrible cancer. And when I bring up the words cancer or death to the family, the family has no idea what I'm talking about. They didn't know it was so severe. They didn't know that the chemotherapy wasn't going to cure this cancer. And I, I, it communicates to me there's a need there to be addressed. Uh, also in the ER, I have the opportunity to, in the middle of the night, run up to codes in the ICU. And very often, <clears throat> we are doing codes hour after hour, day after day, on patients who everybody knows are not going to leave this hospital. But somehow, we've not been effective as medical professionals in communicating what we know to the patient's family who needs to know that. And lastly, uh, when I was in medical school, we had a remarkable hemato-oncologist. He was not only, uh, I think at the time he was chair of medicine, he was also the chair of the ethics committee, <clears throat> and he refused to allow his patients to be DNR. If one of his patients wanted to be DNR, they would have to find a new doctor. He refused to accept it. He had a strong principled stance. And even at the time, when I was 23 or 24, I thought, this is crazy. And it, it just seemed that there was a conflict there between what medicine had to offer and should offer and what parents or patients were requesting and some sort of disconnect in between. So it convinced me that there was a need to be filled and that uh, led me to believe that especially the focus on quality of life really uh, had a lot, of, a lot of value to offer to individual patients and also to our healthcare system as a whole. Uh, so that's what motivated me to jump into the fellowship. And also, quite frankly, I think there's a lot of opportunities for palliative care now. This is a new field. Um, I, I think it is fair to say that the great discoveries that will define this field are yet to be made. I think it's fair to say that the physicians who have been practicing palliative care for the last 10 years and the ones who will practice it for the next 10 years are going to define this field. And if I had, if I had chosen a fellowship in something else, <clears throat> who knows what, cardiology or toxicology, I don't think there would be that, no offense, Ron, that sense of being on the cusp of something new, of the chance of building something as we go forward. I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons there's opportunities in palliative care is because our society is changing. We're having conversations in our society that we wouldn't have had 20 years ago. There was a young woman, I'm sure many of you know, who was on the cover of People magazine because she had decided she was gonna go to Oregon to take advantage of their physician aid in dying because she had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. This is something my wife brought up to me. It's something she and her friends were talking about and something I saw on Facebook uh, many, many times. And I don't think that's a conversation we would have had 15 or 20 years ago. And I think it's a conversation we're going to be having a lot more of in the, the years ahead. And it's a good conversation to have, both as individuals and as members of society. And then lastly, I saw in palliative care uh, opportunities for myself, not just, not just what I've described previously, an opportunity to change course and pursue a new career. But I think a lot of what palliative care deals with is the opposite side of the emergency medicine coin, if you will. If a patient comes to the emergency department, there are seven things that are going to happen, and there's going to be no deviation from that. And very often in emergency medicine, we're taught to act first and think second, because there's sometimes not time to think. 
Palliative care is the flip side of that. In palliative care, the emphasis is on thinking first, talking, and then choosing from this buffet of options whatever medical treatments fit the, the specific goals of the individual. It's not, it's not a cookbook uh, or one size fit all uh, approach to medicine, and sometimes emergency medicine is. Uh, if a patient comes in and they're not breathing, I have one solution, and that patient gets that solution regardless of their background or their desires. And also I think that uh, as an ER doctor, a lot of the interfaces for critical, critically ill patients and patients with severe symptomology and life-limiting disease, a lot of their interface with medicine occurs through the ER. They're coming in by ambulance, they're going through the ER to the ICU. So I think an ER doctor in palliative care has a lot of opportunities to, to interact with healthcare and with individual patients. Uh, obviously, the other side of opportunity is challenge, and uh, you're, my Chinese is not good enough to know if this is true, but I'm told that these are the symbols in Chinese that represent both the words for opportunity and challenge. And I think that's apt. Um, uh, there's a lot of opportunity in palliative care now, certainly that's how I appreciate it, but there's certainly some challenges. And those challenges are, in general, the opposite side of the coin. Uh, for instance, um, one of the realities in palliative care is that the economics of medicine haven't found where palliative care fits exactly. It's easy for me as an ER doctor to say, I'm gonna see this many patients, this is my average RVU, <coughs> this is my economic value. It's much different they're much more difficult as a palliative care doctor to say, I'm going to have this many conversations, and in five years, trust me, there's going to be some benefit. That's a harder sales pitch to make. That's a challenge. I think it's also an opportunity because since, uh, since value cannot be quantified, it allows us an opportunity to define it possibly in other terms, uh, but definitely a challenge to face. Uh, one of the challenges in palliative care is that this is a specialty that focuses on difficult conversations. Uh, I have had a number of difficult conversations, and there's very few that I walk away from thinking, boy, that went really well. Nailed that. Yeah, usually they're very difficult conversations for everybody involved. And that makes it easy for physicians to avoid. It also makes it easy for patients to avoid it. Uh, you can't hang up a shingle as a palliative care doctor and put ads in the newspaper and billboards on the highway saying, come talk to me about your impending death. Yeah, nobody's going to take time out of their day and schedule schedule a few days off work to come, come have that conversation. Uh, so they're easy to avoid and easy to pretend away, and that's a challenge for palliative care. And I say that from personal experience. In the course of this fellowship, I've told hundreds of patients how important it is to fill out an advanced directive, but I haven't filled out an advanced directive. It's, it's just too easy to put that off and ignore it. Uh, one of the realities of palliative care is that we are working in other specialties' domains. We're working on oncology's domain. We're working on their turf. And we have an obligation to respect their, their primacy in their field. We're working on cardiology's field. Uh, that's something ER doctors know a lot about. And uh, it's, it's an opportunity because it allows us to work throughout the hospital with many, many different fields. Sometimes serve as, as a uh, point of contact between disparate fields, but it's also a challenge. And then the last is there's a battle about how to define the field of palliative care. There are any number of people who view palliative care as a solution to their problems, uh, not necessarily a solution to patients' problems or to some kind of greater structural problems within healthcare, but specific problems that hospital administrators are facing or uh, CEOs are facing or COOs are facing. Uh, one of the examples of this is the first palliative care doctor I worked with prior to coming to this fellowship is a woman who's exceptional, Lisa Raptus, but part of her job is serving on the hospital's catastrophe team. And the catastrophe team is called in when a patient has been in the hospital too long and has cost the hospital too much money. And so she is called in as a palliative care doctor to solve this problem. And in the minds of the CEOs, that means this patient has a, a sufficiently adequate solution is either this patient leaving on hospice or being in DNR. And there's always going to be people on the outside pressuring palliative care to define themselves in that role. And it's a challenge to push back and say, no, that's not what we do. I'm not the closer. I'm not the person who's here to uh, deal with these difficult economic situations. Uh, palliative care is something else. And that's going to be a constant friction and a challenge to deal with. I think this is my, apparently, yes, this is my last slide. <laughs> Why don't I stop?
and maybe it's a good time to answer questions. Thank you, Matt. Um, before you graduate, you need to finish an advanced directive. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, we're not here to answer any questions, any comments that you may have, but I'm really proud to see this is a, this is just a really, I think this is a landmark time for all of us, and a really exciting time, and I appreciate all of you coming today. I mean, we have a room that's pretty packed, and um, so anyways, enough about us, it's, it's about you. Please, um, any comments? And I know we have some friends in the room who, um, please, I'd love to hear your question. And please attack these two doctors um, and ask them what they plan to do for the future or so. That's a great point. I really appreciate your, your comment on that. Um, we actually have a lot of tools in palliative care that are at our disposal um, in terms of trying to determine prognosis and trying to classify patients in, in terms of their functional abilities and, and, and so forth. But I think it's a great, a great point to bring up that you know, in some patients, the visual would be uh, a very good thing because it, is, it can be a challenge to uh, discuss a prognosis, particularly when it's a, a bad prognosis. And so you know, we try to be very, very careful. Um, we try to make sure that we have good communication with our referring uh, physicians to make sure that we're on the same page and we're saying the, the same thing. But I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Dr. Sinclair? Yeah. I got my hands on my back. I know. That's <laughs> Actually, yeah, one of the more questions that come to my mind is uh, how would you approach, say, a woman with breast cancer just been diagnosed, uh, maybe some, even a stage one or a DCIS where there's some question that's even cancer at all, and yet opportunity-wise it would be the ideal time to stop with the point of thing because you need to have a treatment that done. At least your literature supports that. On the other hand, how do you... It's an excellent question, and I wish I had an excellent offer or an excellent answer to offer in return. It's extremely delicate uh, because this is a person who's been given a terrible, frightening diagnosis, and you want to minimize the fear and the anxiety associated with that. And yet, at the same time, you want to talk about some realities that are on the horizon. It's, it needs to be approached delicately. I think, in general, uh, it's better to approach this conversation in several small steps than try to accomplish everything in one single conversation. So the first thing you need to do, I, I feel, is to establish some rapport, and that can be something very simple, like addressing symptoms. Usually, usually addressing a patient's symptoms are a good entree to develop a relationship with them. And then once you've dealt, developed a therapeutic relationship, then you can address things asking, what are your fears? And if you have somebody tell you about what their fears are, uh, very commonly the big issues in palliative care, they will bring up on their own. It's, we don't need to bring up the worst case scenario. It's already in their head. So we ask them, what are your fears? What are your concerns? And they will come to us with the things we need to talk about. And it allows us a, a less invasive way, I think a more tolerated way, 
to get into those issues and discuss them. Um, I, I think those are two approaches. Trying to do things in several small bites instead of one big conversation. And also letting the patients come to us with the fears and the concerns that are already in their minds. I don't know that I can add to that. You covered that so well. Um, but um, yeah, it, it takes time. time and um, Small pieces is very, very important. So we will have a family meeting and, or meeting just with the patient and we see how that goes. We may need to come back and, have, and pick up where we left off. The goal may not be reached after four or five meetings. Uh, we may have to bring in help, and as always, and this is a great time to mention uh, the, the team aspect of uh, palliative care again. We may want to go and, and bring the uh, social worker. In fact, I've been told, never have a family meeting without a social worker. And so, um, yeah, it, it, because everyone is thinking, uh, and, and also I want to uh, bring up uh, Pastor Gerald, We've had some wonderful family meetings with our pastoral uh, staff here. So, because people are thinking from their area of, of interest in looking at the, the, the patient's problem from, from, from their perspective, it is so, so important to have the, the, the input from um, the other the team members. And when you see this thing working, it's fantastic. It really is fantastic. So, um, we've had challenges. Um, along the way. And you never know what the situation is going to turn out to be once you walk in, in that room. But I can always, I can say this, that eventually it gets to a place where most people are satisfied. And so it's, it's just a wonderful thing to experience. I guess you're a psychologist here. Yes, I am. Yes, we are. Um, we we do use our our, um, our psychiatrists and our psychologists as part of the palliative medicine team. Now we head up the um, the outpatient clinic, and this is where we utilize a lot of Dr. Pere um, Dr. Perez's, who is an oncology psychologist, to help our patients through. Yes, there's. It is a very much a multidisciplinary type of approach. It's not the physicians with a prescription to here, take this and I'll see you in a month. It's about how to pull together the entire team to care for the person. And we talked about how you broach such a difficult subject with patients and family. How do you, as the attending physician or the oncologist, the beauty of this, as you heard from our, our, our fellows, is that pill to medicine is a team approach. I'm a doctor, but I'm not the lead. I, can, I get this title as the medical director of the program, but within a team, I'm just another guy with a, in my own opinion. And I'm listening to the rest of what my team has to say to deal with the emotional, the psychological, and the spiritual. So how do you deal with this with someone who is so, so afraid and, and how do you bridge this? So sometimes they don't need me as a doctor. You know, if you're already handling this as a physician, then you know, utilize a social worker to help. But if there are some other issues that our, our social workers are identifying, this person needs a psychologist needs a psychiatrist. Let's pull them in. So you are very much a part of that team, and a plug to the spiritual side of things too. And you know, sometimes we feel that the work that we do is, you know, when when, when we care for a person, we forget about the spirituality of their of the, of the essence of who they are. We have not care for the entire person. So when we talk about the whole person care, the whole person approach, we have to put that in there. And I'm really proud of Hogue. I mean, sometimes you know, in the past they push for pastoral care. Now that I see that the nurses, if I forget, the nurses will, will put the orders in there on my behalf and say, let's get spiritual care for these patients who are really seriously ill. So I want to put a plug into our nurses here, which I might really appreciate. Yes? In addition to pharmaceutical and respiratory support for symptom management, are there any other treatment modalities that you see in the future coming up? 
Right. Are you speaking specifically for congestive heart failure? Uh, no. Oh. Just for general palliative care. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, the answer the answer is yes. Uh, on broad, broad field. Um, I guess I hardly know where to begin. A lot of what we deal with is pain. Obviously, there's excellent choices for pain. I think one of the cutting edges in terms of therapeutics for palliative care is what are known as non-pharmacologic, or if you prefer, enviropsychosocial interventions. And there are many, many cases where giving patients more opioids is the wrong step, and that they can be very well served with, uh, for instance, um, exercising on a regular basis. There's been good evidence that exercising 30 minutes a day, I think three times a week, is as good for treating depression as our best antidepressants. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are effective in treating pain that are not pharmaceuticals. I think that is a, a field that we as doctors are perhaps not inclined towards, but we should be. And I think there's often other people on the team who have a better appreciation and maybe even a better understanding of the non-pharmacologic approaches to dealing with some of the very common symptoms we see with in palliative care. There's pet therapy, I'm sorry, pet therapy, and there's also music therapy. I mean, this is something that, um, that we entertain with our palliative care team where, where we may have a music therapist walking around the hospital and sound like Tinkerbell or something. Uh, not quite that way, but I, I, I don't want to suppress this, this area of specialty of these, of these therapists. But these are some things that we like to be able to, but you know, this is a small step approach. And uh, that was an excellent question, an excellent answer. I'm going to use that for the next time. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here with us today, and please allow applause for our fellows.